In this video, we will discuss the detailed anatomy of the uvea. Starting with an introduction, we will proceed to describe the various components of the uvea, including the iris, ciliary body, and choroid. Before we conclude, we will also explore the blood and nerve supply to these areas. The uvea is the vascular layer of the eye and is composed of three distinct anatomical sections, the iris, positioned at the front, the iris is the most anterior segment of the uvea. It is characterized by its pigmentation and diaphragm-like structure, with the pupil forming the central opening. The iris's color determines a person's eye color. Functionally, the iris regulates the amount of light that enters the eye by adjusting the size of the pupil in response to light intensity. The ciliary body, an extension of the iris, the ciliary body houses the ciliary muscle, which is responsible for changing the lens's shape to focus on objects at various distances. It also produces the aqueous humor, the fluid that occupies the front part of the eye. Lastly the choroid, located posteriorly, the choroid is a highly pigmented and vascularized layer situated beneath the outer surface of the eyeball, extending from the optic nerve to the ciliary body. Its primary function is to provide nutritional support to the outer layers of the retina through its dense network of blood vessels. We will now detail the components of the uvea, beginning with the iris. The iris constitutes the most anterior segment of the uveal tract and is contiguous with the inner aspect of the ciliary body located posteriorly. The iris itself is a thin, circular structure, akin to a contractile disc. It features a central aperture known as the pupil. The pupil's size is dynamic, continuously adjusting to regulate the volume of light that reaches the retina. The pupillary light reflex is a critical function of the iris, characterized by the pupil's constriction in response to light, followed by dilation in darkness. This reflex demonstrates the antagonistic actions of the iris's muscles, which are responsible for the pupil's size modulation. From a clinical perspective, the application of topical atropine to the eye causes midriasis, which is the dilation of the pupil. This occurs due to atropine's inhibition of the pupillary sphincter muscle's contraction, preventing it from constricting the pupil. Understanding these mechanisms is essential for the clinical management of various ocular conditions and for interventions that necessitate pupil dilation for better examination of the eye's internal structures. Regarding the macroscopic anatomy of the iris, it serves as a dividing structure within the anterior segment of the eye, demarcating the anterior and posterior chambers. The aqueous humor circulates and bathes both the anterior and posterior surfaces of the iris. The diameter of the iris typically measures around 12 mm. It exhibits variability in thickness, with the densest part being at the collarette, measuring approximately 0.6 mm, and thinnest at the iris root, measuring around 0.1 mm. The iris is comprised of two surfaces, an anterior surface and a posterior surface, and two borders, a lateral border and a medial border. Clinically, in conditions like iritis, the use of contact lenses is discouraged due to the potential for the development of synechiae, which are adhesions between the iris and other ocular structures such as the lens or cornea. Prophylactic or therapeutic administration of dilating eye drops can be an effective measure to prevent iritis or alleviate its symptoms by relaxing the muscles of the iris, thereby reducing the risk of synechiae formation. The ciliary body, as the second component of the uveal tract, serves as the intermediary segment of the uveal tract, forming a flattened ring that contains the ciliary processes and ciliary muscles. These structures are crucial in facilitating lens accommodation for focusing on objects at varying distances and in the production of aqueous humor that fills the anterior chamber of the eye. Concerning its macroscopic anatomy, the ciliary body is an asymmetrical ring-like structure situated adjacent to the lens equator. When viewed in cross-section, the ciliary body presents a triangular shape defined by a base, an apex, and two distinct surfaces, the anterolateral surface, which is in close contact with the sclera. The anteromedial surface, which is divided into an anterior section that contains the ciliary processes, known as the pars plicata, which is vascularized. A posterior section, the pars planar, which is smooth and avascular. The base of the ciliary body is its most anterior segment, where the iris attaches centrally. Conversely, the apex is the most posterior and slender part of the ciliary body, aligning with the aura serrata, the junction between the light-sensitive retina and the ciliary body. Lastly, addressing the final component of the uveal tract, the choroid forms the posterior segment. 
This highly vascular membrane is strategically positioned between the sclera and the retina, playing a crucial role in ocular nutrition. Concerning its macroscopic anatomy, the choroid initiates anteriorly at the aura serrata, a serrated junction where the sensitive retina ends, and extends to the optic disc at the back of the eye, where the optic nerve exits the eye. Between the choroid and the sclera is the suprachoroid layer, a potential space known for its rich network of capillaries and larger blood vessels, facilitating an exchange of nutrients and wastes. The choroid is firmly bound to the retina by Bruch's membrane, an elastic layer that serves as a critical support for the retina's outer layers, ensuring their proper positioning and function. The venous pressure in the choroid is notably high, commonly surpassing 20 mm of mercury. This pressure gradient is vital for counteracting the fluid pressure within the eye, thereby contributing to the equilibrium that results in a stable intraocular pressure. Such stability is paramount for the eye's structural integrity and optimal visual function. Upon exploring the different elements of the uveal tract, it's important to consider its blood supply. The uvea is among the most vascularized tissues, with its primary vascular supply coming from the ophthalmic artery. This artery branches into two main vessels that serve the uvea, the short posterior ciliary arteries and the long posterior ciliary arteries. The long posterior ciliary arteries, originating as two branches from the ophthalmic artery, the nasal and temporal arteries, these vessels, together with the anterior ciliary arteries, converge to establish the major arterial circle of the iris. This circle is crucial as it supplies the choroid, ciliary body, and iris. The short posterior ciliary arteries, numbering between 6 to 12, these arteries branch out from the ophthalmic artery and create a network of capillaries known as the choriocapillaris, which is essential for supplying the choroid up to the ciliary processes. In addition, the anterior ciliary arteries, which emanate from the circulatory network of the extraocular muscles, contribute to the blood supply of the anterior portion of the uvea and assist in forming the minor arterial circle found within the ciliary body. The venous drainage of the eye, it involves a network of small veins that collect blood from the iris, ciliary body, and choroid. These converge to form the vortex veins, also known as veni vorticosi. Typically, there are four vortex veins, the superior and inferior temporal veins, and the superior and inferior nasal veins. These then drain into the larger superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. The innervation of the uvea is an intricate system involving both the short and long ciliary nerves. These nerves are responsible for the regulation of the pupil's size and the eye's ability to accommodate for near and far vision. The short ciliary nerves provide parasympathetic innervation to the iris sphincter muscle. This parasympathetic input originates from the Edinger Westfall nucleus, travels with the oculomotor nerve, and synapses in the ciliary ganglion. The postganglionic fibers then reach the iris sphincter muscle, causing constriction of the pupil in response to light or for near vision focus. On the other hand, the iris dilator muscle receives sympathetic innervation through the long ciliary nerves. These sympathetic fibers originate in the superior cervical ganglion and travel along the internal carotid plexus to the eye. Activation of these fibers results in the dilation of the pupil, allowing more light to enter or adjusting the vision for distant objects. The balance between these sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs is essential for the dynamic regulation of the pupil, enabling the eye to adjust to varying light conditions and distances of focus. This delicate balance is known as the pupillary light reflex, which is not only vital for vision but also can be an important diagnostic tool for assessing neurological function. In summary, the uvea is a critical pigmented layer of tissue that lines the inside of the sclera and plays an essential role in the eye's function. The name uvea is derived from the Latin term uva for grape, a nod to its distinctive grape-like appearance when the eye is anatomically dissected. The uvea is susceptible to various pathologies, the most common of which include uveitis, which is the inflammation of the uvea. It can lead to redness, pain, light sensitivity, and vision loss. Glaucoma, a group of diseases that damage the eye's optic nerve and can result in vision loss and blindness and neoplastic diseases, these include tumors that may arise from the uveal tissue, such as melanomas. Uveal melanomas are the most common primary intraocular malignancy in adults. The health of the uvea is vital for the overall functioning of the eye, particularly in its roles in providing blood supply, regulating light entry, and supporting the retina.
Due to the variety of disorders that can affect the uvea, regular eye examinations are crucial for early detection and management of uveal conditions.